Welcome to the 325th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I talk about COVID in South Korea and research with Jun Jeon and Young Jun Yo of the National Assembly Futures Institute of Korea. Just a reminder, you can usually catch COVID calls live on weekdays at its new time of 6 p.m. Eastern time. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch and intermittently, we do COVID calls broadcasts at 5.30 p.m. Korea time. And I always try to give a heads up for those. And today is a special one of those. Thank you for joining us. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. Please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, August 23, 2021, there are 4,431,554 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. Rather than continuing to read so many of the COVID death numbers, which I've done over the last year, numbers which strike me now as inaccurate and not a good way to visualize the suffering of this disaster, I'm going to continue raising different COVID measures that I'd like to know about in addition to the death totals. I put out the call for COVID numbers that people would like to know, and I got some really interesting responses. I'd like to read one now. And this is from Wes in Japan. His Twitter handle is Wes in Japan, and I know him to be a disaster researcher based in Japan. And he asked this, if we could measure extended family who had to take over childcare for certain periods, what would that add up to? And he added, also, how many parents, women especially, had to leave the workforce to care for children and family? Yet another COVID statistic, which would tell us a lot about the scale and the scope of this disaster, information that is not being collected or reported the way the death totals are, but certainly important to know in the context of this disaster. Thanks, Wes and Japan, for contributing that. I've also been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemics in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Clark R. Allen, 1937 to 2021. This was published by the Hunterdon County Democrat in New Jersey, published August 3rd, 2021. Clark R. Allen, founding member of Clinton First Aid Squad, of Lantana, Florida, passed away on July 22nd, 2021 at the age of 84. Clark died due to COVID-19. He was infected by someone who chose to not get vaccinated and his death was preventable. It is the wish of his family that everyone get vaccinated in order to prevent further death, sickness, and heartbreak. Clark was born in Trenton, New Jersey in 1937, the son of Carol and Edna Allen. He graduated from North Hunterdon Regional High School, where he was the captain of the track and field team, president of both the High Y and Key Club, and member of the baseball team. He went on to receive his Bachelor of Science from Springfield College, where he served as editor-in-chief of both the college newspaper and the yearbook. He was also the general manager of the college radio station and a member of both the track and cross-country teams. During college, Clark participated in the Marine Corps Platoon Leadership Program, and he served as an officer for three years once he graduated. After a brief stint as a sports reporter for the Washington Post, he began his lifelong career in advertising and marketing for consumer packaged goods. Clark was the founding member of the Clinton, New Jersey First Aid and Rescue Squad. He was a certified EMT and EMT trainer. Shortly before retirement, Clark began his second career in Greenwich, Connecticut, as a baseball umpire and football official at high school and youth league levels. Clark loved all things sports and relished his second career. In Paul Beach County, he worked as a precinct clerk, then field clerk and supervisor in elections. 
Clark firmly believed in everyone's right to vote and in the democratic process. It cannot go unmentioned how much Clark also enjoyed animals. He regularly sent his children pictures of wild and tame animals he met and even named. Clark is survived by his beloved children, George Allen, Kevin Allen, Deidre Davenport, Kelly Allen, Nicole Allen, Christopher Allen, and Danielle Allen. He's also survived by 17 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. Clark's family wants to thank the nurses at JFK Hospital in Atlantis, Florida, for their incredible kindness and compassion to Clark when he was unable to have family at his side due to COVID-19. A memorial for the family will be held privately. In lieu of flowers, please consider a donation to one of Clark's favorite nonprofits, the ASPCA. The obituary of Clark R. Allen, who lived from 1937 to 2021. Okay, I'd like to turn to my conversation for today. This one has been a while in the making and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Let me introduce my guests to you. June John first is Associate Research Fellow at the National Assembly Futures Institute in the Republic of Korea. June was previously a postdoctoral fellow at Tufts University's Center for Civic Science and he's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. June is a sociologist of science and technology, studying how social power interacts with science and technology. Previously, he studied science policy changes during the Trump administration based on laboratory ethnography. Currently, he's investigating how COVID-19 is shaping discourses on science and democracy in both South Korea and the United States. My second guest is Yong Jun Yo. He's Associate Research Fellow at the National Assembly Futures Institute. He received his PhD from the Technology Management Economics and Policy Program of Seoul National University in 2019 with a dissertation titled Essays on Innovation, Human Capital, and Economic Growth in a Knowledge-Based Economy, Computable General Equilibrium Modeling for Innovation Policy Assessment. He joined the National Assembly Futures Institute in 2019 and is now conducting research on future-oriented innovation-driven growth strategies. His research interests include innovation and industrial policy, innovation-driven growth, economics and policy impact assessments, and currently he is sketching a wide range of possible scenarios for the COVID-19 economy, which would set the Korean economy on different courses in the recovery period. I want to welcome both my guests, Jun Jeon and Young Jun Kim. Thank you so much for joining me today on COVID calls. Uh, excuse me, Young Jun Yo. Apologies for that. <laughs> Great to see you both. Thank you for inviting us for this COVID call. We really look. Uh, we were. We are really excited about joining this. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's a very great honor to discuss about the meaningful arguments on COVID nineteen. Thank you. So why don't we start the way I usually do, to just find out where you're calling from, and maybe if you can give us a snapshot of what the pandemic looks like there today. June, can I start with you, please? Yeah, so uh, we are both working in Seoul, South Korea, and today uh, we have 387 new confirmed cases in Seoul, in Seoul, South Korea. This is significantly lower than other days because the samples were collected during weekend. So ordinary during uh, these, these days, uh, we have more than 500 uh, positive new cases during a weekday. And, uh, uh, these day, uh, and today uh, in whole South Korea, we had uh, 1,418 uh, new confirmed cases. Uh, and we have cumulative uh, 238,000 uh, 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 confirmed positive COVID cases in South Korea. And in South Korea, uh, we have cumulative death of 2,222 deaths so far, and uh, the rate uh, and the uh, the the and the progress of the vaccination, a full vaccination, is about 23 percent in Korea uh, in South Korea. You're both um, there in Seoul, so it's the same same snapshot for both of you. I wonder if you might just say. A little bit about that vaccination number, 23%, which for people listening who are not in South Korea, um, it might mm -hmm. sound a little strange to have such a relatively low infection rate and death rate, comparatively speaking, 
mm-hmm. but also a low vaccination rate. I wonder yes. how you account for that. So uh, actually, the the you know the uh, uh, except uh, Johnson and Johnson vaccines, all vaccines have two steps of the procedure. And if we count only the first procedure, then we have about 50% of the vaccination of, of vaccination rate. And the 23% means like full vaccination, including first and the, uh, the second one as well. So uh, it, it is slowly making a progress, but I think uh, Korea overall is suffering, uh, suffering from the uh, vaccine shortage and people are trying to really get their vaccination, but it's not really easy to uh, reserve for the vaccine. So it's getting better, uh, but it takes time. Well, that might be an issue that we'll we'll talk about throughout our our conversation uh, today. This issue of uh, the sort of problem of how to procure vaccine in a global market in the middle of a of a pandemic is has been a challenging one. Um, I'd like to ask you both um, if you might also reflect a little bit, maybe share a memory, something about this COVID era, the pandemic, from any point in time. Um, some memory that really sticks with you. Young Jun, can I start with you on that? Uh, yes, uh, I think the rapid spread of COVID-19 across the globe and also in Korean economy has left worsening inequality in its wake. The gap between the haves and the haves not, which was widening before the pandemic has further been uh, exacerbated and threatens to slow prospects for economic growth in the post-pandemic world. And also in Korea, strike divide among individuals, companies, and industries is urgent issue for the government. Uh, For example, the rich and poor, and between the large and small companies, and between IT and non-IT industries. So also, for example, the greatest job losses after the ASEAN financial crisis has been emerged in these uh, years, and also the temporary workers and women experiencing the greatest fall in job opportunities. Mm. And I think on the other hand, COVID-19 also created uh, windows of opportunities in terms of new technology development, such as digital transformation, change in work circumstances to promote productivity, or stimulation of regional innovation of local cooperatives to proceed uh, recovery. So I think the, it creates it create opportunities also the threatens in terms of inequality. Thank you for sharing that, June. Let me ask you the same question. Anything that um, you know, a memory of this period that really sticks with you? Yongjun's put a lot on the table there in yeah. terms of issues that he's concerned about at this time. I really appreciate mm-hmm. him sharing that. Jun, what about you? Yeah. So compared to Young Jun, my uh, memory about COVID is mu- much more personal because uh, uh, last year uh, when the pandemic was started, I was in the US and then I experienced the extreme suffering and spread of the COVID in the US. And I also had to see my families are suffering in South Korea without my help. And at that time, uh, uh, when the when, when the COVID nineteen was started, my mom was in a cancer ward, and my grandmother was in Alzheimer hospital, and both of them were prohibited uh, 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 to meet any guests or their family, so they were uh, lived alone in a hospital for more than three months, and then uh, they both of them chose to discharge themselves from the hospital and just came back to the house because they just want to meet people and talk to people, and that was the strongest memory for me. And I was really shocked when I came back to Korea uh, this uh, this year because in the U.S., uh, most memory about the COVID was about death. But in Korea, the problem of death and life related to COVID was not really part of people's experience. I don't know why, but um, I was really shocked to see that not many uh, people in South Korea were sensitive uh, about people's uh, problem of life and death. Maybe that's because South Korea is experiencing relatively... Uh, uh, milder uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, related disaster. Uh, I think we should talk about that as well. So yeah, my experience is more about really family experience. Thank you for sharing that. I I know other others as well who faced something similar um, uh, to what you did, Juno, maybe slightly different. I'm, and I'm sorry to hear that you were dealing with those health concerns from that, from that mm-hmm. distance, but Korean, Koreans who were in the United States 
um, or Korean Americans with family back in Korea who found themselves experiencing that distance in a way that they never had in their in their lives. And that, that sounds like what you were going through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Before the, before the pandemic, even when my mom was in a hospital, I didn't really feel that much guilt about guilty about that because other family members like my younger brother, my dad, mm -hmm. they were they were all able to care my mom personally. But uh, since the pandemic, that all personal network of care uh, was somehow uh, suddenly destroyed. And uh, I think that really impacted people who are more socially isolated more than ever. Let's turn the conversation now to, to some of the research that you've both been doing. And I think to set the context a little bit, we should probably hear about this really fascinating research center that you're both part of, the National Assembly Futures Institute. So let's just start with that. Young Chun, maybe you could tell us what is the National Assembly Futures Institute? Uh, yes, uh, the National Assembly Futures Institute is a government-funded research institute under the direct supervision of the Speaker of National Assembly. Uh, it is a bipartisan institute that prepares for the future of Korea and develops its long-term strategies. And the NAFI has been established in 2018, and now we are accumulating expertise in futures research, different from other research institutes, which are subject to our short-term strategy development. So in addition, we are trying to perform integrated and interdisciplinary research, maintaining the neutrality among diverse views of contesting political parties. So yes, so we are now preparing the long term and we are also doing future prediction, also selecting the policy options to achieve preferred uh, futures, and we are now preparing the strategy development with a neutrality. Yeah. June, was well, there, a, so 2018, was there a precipitating event that, that uh, led to the creation of this unit? Me? No, mm -hmm. I, I was not really part of the process of the emergence of this group. Actually, I just got into this group a few months mm -hmm. ago, and uh, I have been learning what kind of researchers uh, are uh, happening in this National Assembly Futures Institute. And uh, I think a really unique thing about this institute is that this is under the aegis of the National Assembly, not the governmental executive branch, uh, because uh, uh, almost every other research institute in South Korea are under the aegis of the governmental executive branch, not under the legislative branch. And this National Assembly Futures Institute is dedicated to enhance the research capacity of the legislative branch uh, beyond the kind of a service provider's perspective. So we do some more strategic research to uh, inform uh, uh, lawmakers what kind of future uh, policies uh, will we need in our future society. Does that mean that any legislator in the National Assembly in South Korea could initiate a, an inquiry to this to this body and, and the researchers would, would pick it up? Uh, I think ideally that can happen always. And actually the, mm -hmm. the small kind of chatting and meeting uh, with National Assembly members and their secretaries and other related researchers, uh, small meetings are happening all the time. Uh, I have heard that uh, these days because of the pandemic, the meeting is not really happening that often, but uh, it used to be much more active. Is it true, Youngjun? Yes, very actively, yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. And I'm sure uh, much of it right now must be COVID related. Um, Youngjun, it's, it's pretty fascinating to me also to imagine a, a, a research institute like this getting started, barely going for a year, and then COVID hits. That's pretty dramatic. Yes. But mm -hmm. Let me let me follow up with with that. I, I think a, a lot of people around the world have heard about the Korean response, the early days, the Korean response to the pandemic. We'll, we'll turn to you know what's happened in the last few months, maybe later in the discussion, but um, even so much that it's come to be called a sort of Korean model or a Korean method of dealing with, mm -hmm. with COVID. I don't know if either of one of you wants to speak to that, but when people talk about a, co a COVID model or Korean COVID model, what, 
what do you think that that means? What are the characteristics of how Korea, South Korea, responded in the early days of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, if I characterize the uh, the specific aspect of Korean experience of COVID nineteen, I would say that is about the uh, the question of the responsibility. Who takes the responsibility of the care uh, during this time of the crisis? I think uh, compared, I think many people would agree that uh, compared to many other countries like United States, the Korean government was much more explicit about uh, the fact that the responsibility responsibility of the care and risk management during this pandemic time should be government. So uh, I think the uh, uh, public health policy and devices and all other infrastructure, I think were uh, pretty much rapidly mobilized uh, uh, to cope with this crisis uh, from the government side. So I think the, this question of the whose who's responsibility, uh, I think that was the core uh, part of the so-called Korean model of the pandemic uh, uh, strategy, I think. Mm. Uh also, I think the Korean responses to COVID very effectively in the initial stage. In Korea, I think the governments has shown great capabilities to organize and manage their resources efficiently in the short run. Also, I think that before the COVID-19, uh, Korea has tendency to follow the front runners, uh, such as developed countries. However, the, with existing private and public partnership and capabilities of government, Korea has uh, proposed a new model of the, how to adapt to the a great crisis or yeah, such that. So I think it was very good opportunity for us to prove that our capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's just build on that a little bit. Yongjun, let me ask you first, what are the COVID-related research projects that the National Assembly Futures Institute is, is working on? I know there must be m many, but walk us through the first one that comes to mind. Uh, yeah, for example, uh, last year, uh, we had conducted uh, one research project uh, entitled as Global Infectious Disease and Social Changes. In this project, uh, we have tried to address the social changes undergone by the world after the four global infectious diseases, for example, the COVID-19, MERS, and SARS, that have occurred since 2000. Through this, uh, we have tried to explore something the world has experienced in common, result resulting from the global diseases. And this year, the, we also uh, doing some COVID-19 project. Uh, and we, from this project, we are trying to identify a set of future driving forces and derive, derive the possible resulting scenarios for the COVID-19 economy, which would set the Korean economy on different courses in the recovery period. In this regard, we are aiming to present a representative post-pandemic scenario, which can help decision makers reassess and test the robustness of existing plans and policies. Thank you for that, June. Did you want to build on that at all? Other projects that you've been working on or comment on either of those? Uh, June, I think you're muted temporarily. I'm sorry, this happens no all the time, even no after a year of the pandemic. So uh, I, I actually like it when it happens because it, it proves that we've, we're still human beings instead of yes. fully AI at this point. So exactly. So yeah, so you know, on top of that, uh, last year also uh, Nafi conducted research about the uh, preferred future and expected future and the people's thought about their future imaginary. And uh, uh, the, the meaning of preferred future uh, as opposed to the expected future is that preferred future is people's imagination of their preferred future, uh, whereas expected future is a future that will come into realized when nothing happens, uh, no interruption happens. And uh, we found that uh, people were eager to, uh, uh, eager to realize the uh, distributional and conservational future. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, uh, during the pandemic, people were less interested 
in really doing some active role in environmental preservation, but they were more willing to uh, uh, find some vaccine cure and rapid going back to the normal, as opposed to the fundamental uh, uh, reflection upon the social and environmental problems during the pandemic. Uh, I think that was the, that was really interesting finding because even during this great uh, great crisis, uh, um, it seems like South Korea was more uh, into the mode of the rec- uh, they were more dreaming in uh, dreaming the mode of the recovery rather than full reflection of the modernization. That's interesting. So t- tell me a little bit more about the methodology here. I mean, th- are these interviews that are done um, on a large scale? Are these public mm-hmm. opinion? Um, interviews done distributed mm-hmm. uh, across the country? Are you building on existing published sources? What's your method? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in case of last year, uh, the National Assembly uh, of Future Institute condu- conducted a, a massive uh, size of survey uh, for general public. So sample size was, in my memory, it was about 3,000. So based on the uh, uh, random sample, uh, randomly sampled 3,000 responses, we uh, found the general trend. And then out of that uh, 3,000 responses, we uh, uh, contacted a chosen number of 200 people for more deeper con- uh, a conversation. And we invited uh, all of them for the kind of a consensus conference for the future imagination. And the more deeper uh, a conversation about the future, uh, based on that, we kind of extracted what kind of contents were uh, shared during the conversation. come in on that as well. Were you part of that team that created that questionnaire? So uh, in case of last year, no, I was not because I joined the National Assembly this March. Uh, Mm. But this same, uh, a very similar project is happening again in this year. And this year, I'm part of the team. So uh, this year, uh, we are more trying to find people's preference of policy over another policy option. So we are more forcing people to choose the policy option out of the dichotomy so that we can understand what kind of values people are pursuing in South Korea. I see. Young Jun, let me bring you back in on on this question about priority setting. I mean, how, how do you go about giving people choices? With, with futures. I mean, when we talk about future policy solutions to really wicked problems like a pandemic, um, mm-hmm. it, I, I'm curious to know how you even begin to frame those solutions out. How do you begin to uh, put it into a survey? It seems very challenging to me. Yes. Uh, so as I'm part of this team, I think I can talk a little bit more about this particular project. I'm sorry, Youngjun, I'm talking too much. Uh, so <laughs> we, we start drafting the survey uh, out of the experts' opinion. So I think that this uh, this is also interesting part. So we started collect we we started to collect uh, uh, so called uh, uh, experts' opinion about future agenda. And then we uh, extract uh, major, we extracted major keywords out of that. And then we constructed the survey uh, kind of a bottom up uh, from the uh, uh, experts point of view. So, uh, and then as you said, it was kind of an artificial process to dichotomize the uh, policy choice option. So it was kind of a forced question such as, would you prefer the atomic energy uh, or would you prefer renewable energy, not an atom- atomic energy energy anymore? Something like that. So we try to artificially frame the uh, uh, question to force the choice between two different, radically different values. And generally we think about this sort of thing uh, in a democracy as being settled by the election of candidates. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you wait until, you know, candidates tell you what, kind of policies they'll put forward and then they run and then they're either elected or not. But but what you're describing is, um, you know, more along the line of public opinion polling. However, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming I'm right here. It's also attached to it has policy implications. So your findings, then where do they go? Do they go back to the National Assembly for discussion on on budgets? I I guess my question here is, what's the impact of your findings? Mm hmm. So I think there's a long-term uh, goal uh, to make our policy-related research really uh, impactful in a policy arena. I'm not really sure how much uh, uh, impact are we really making, 
But ideally, our hope is that our uh, study of the uh, people's preferred future would somehow impact policymakers in future, and that informs what kind of future can they imagine. So here, uh, the whole concept of the preferred uh, studying about the preferred future is under the, uh, based on the assumption that future is something we all make together collectively. It's not a fixed one. And what people need for their future should be part of our policy agenda. So uh, making voice to people to talk about their uh, imagined future, uh, 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 their imaginaries, I think uh, it itself has a huge implication for policy research, I think. Just a reminder that you're listening to COVID calls, and I'm talking today to Yong Jun Yo and Jun John about the work of the National Assembly Futures Institute in the time of COVID. There's another one of your studies that I'd like to hear more about. Um, this one is titled Study on Future Scenarios and Policy Options for the Innovation Driven Growth of the Post COVID Era. Tell me a little bit about that. Mm, yeah, uh, this year uh, we felt it is necessary to map various scenarios to be developed to increase our ability to respond to changes in the future COVID economy. And we have tried to establish policy alternatives accordingly. In this regard, based on the quantitative analysis using Web of Science, database, we have tried to attempt to observe whether various drivers combine with each other and form new meanings related to the social change of the COVID-19 economy. So based on the, this quantitative analysis, we have tried to extract and also derive the wide range of scenarios which can be emerged in the post COVID or COVID economy. So the, with this uh, analysis, uh, we have extract the examples of the possible future scenarios, uh, such as uh, acceleration of the digital transformation. And also the second one is the resilient and self-sufficient supply chain management. With this respect, a localized social and supply chain and international relations would emerge. And also the third scenario can be summarized as distributed power and localized innovative trials and errors would be emerged in the long run. And the fourth scenario can be described as resilient government with adaptive capabilities and structural changes will be emphasized in the long run. And so in terms of that, the government and public sectors are expected to promote national resilience and adaptive capabilities with desire and innovative responses. And also another example of the scenarios can be summarized as the risk of social and work alienation and society of worlds. So a world, a world in which inequalities increases significantly and disease and human surveillance system would be promoted. So the society of worlds would be the uh, strength, str strengthened in the long run. So the, such as the scenarios are derived from our a study and with these scenarios we are now preparing the how to respond to the, these scenarios and the policy option what kind of policy options to, should be implemented and also designed so we are now working on that uh, issue yeah so just to come back to this a little bit the methodology that June was talking about was one where you um, uh, go to experts where you go to, you know, sort of find out what kinds of different expert-driven scenarios are out there, or you uh, ideas, and you construct those into scenarios. But what happens then? Does the public get an opportunity to to uh, offer opinion about these scenarios? What's the form of engagement around these scenarios? 
So uh, my project is based on survey and the kind of a consensus conference uh, sort of thing. But I think uh, Youngjun's uh, methodology is more based on the big data analysis of the web of science literature. I so uh, we are actually talking about two different projects. And uh, I think mm -hmm. uh, Youngjun's main keywords about the future scenario are based on uh, conversations within the boundary of academia. And uh, uh, in line with what, what you just uh, what, you, what you have just said, this whole future scenario has its fundamental limitation in some sense because those whole agenda has been extracted based on the kind of conversation among experts. So I think you're right. Uh, we should find a way to enhance the inclusivity of the scenario to include uh, general public's uh, voice as well. Mm -hmm. Are, is it too soon to say anything about what the Korean economy has experienced through COVID? I mean, can we paint a general picture, Yongjun uh, or Jun, either one, about what it's meant to the Korean economy to go through this kind of global shock? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think I can start. Uh, uh, so uh, in terms of general degrowth or general decline of the economy by the pandemic, I think that Korea is following the very similar pattern uh, with all other, uh, many other uh, uh, de so-called developed countries around the globe. But I think uh, what is really unique in South Korea is that uh, uh, I think that this is connected to my previous point uh, about the relative mild case of COVID-19 in South Korea. So in South Korea, the COVID-19 is not really a problem of death and life for many people, uh, as opposed to the United States. In the United States, this is really about people's death and life. But in South Korea, people are, sh uh, people are uh, I think, experiencing the crisis COVID-19 more in the financial ways. So I think... Uh, 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 even with this mild case of COVID-19, Korean society experiencing really huge uh, uh, economic gap uh, between wealth and poor. And this tells that how much Korean society has been so much fragile and unequal, even before the pandemic. And uh, I think uh, this COVID-19 should, uh, uh, should be a kind of chance for Korean society to be really reflexive about society we have uh, constructed so far during the mode of the super rapid uh, uh, economic growth uh, during the last half of the 20th century. That's a powerful insight. Youngjun, let me give you a chance to comment on that. And particularly as we think about scenarios for Korea coming out of COVID, um, that inequality and fragility that Jun talks about, um, that's a real threat. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I agree with the Jun's uh, comment and also especially for the industry structure and the firm dynamics, I think the small and medium enterprises and startups are now experiencing great challenges and also they are expected to face constraints in assessing traditional funding and have a form of having a formative relationship with the suppliers and customers. And also the, uh, because they tend to engage in high risk activities compared with other the big, big companies or other jabbers. But however, they are uh, constrained in adopting high technology, high tech technologies such as the digital transformation related technologies. And also they are great they are facing the great uh, challenges in procuring the resources from other uh, parties. So I think it is a very big issue because the government are continuously uh, highlight the role of startups and also the small and medium enterprises, but they are not uh, tailored uh, support measures how to pre how to solve how to give some uh, well-designed support measures to them. So I think it's very great uh, challenges for Korean economy in terms of the inequality. Yeah. That insight is really, it's an interesting one. It reminds me of a COVID calls that I did last year where I talked, we talked about small businesses and family-owned businesses in the United States and the impact um, of COVID there during the lockdown particularly. And, you know, People like to talk about the innovative capacity of small business and startup culture, um, but we know that those are usually pretty lean operations. 
the mm -hmm. United States, there was uh, a period of time in which there were funds made available for people to try to cope. Um, but these were really short term and they mostly impacted larger employers, not smaller ones. I'm not sure in the United States there's been policy solutions put forward to that problem yet. It sounds like that's one of the areas that you might be trying to offer advice on, am I right? Mm -hmm. what, what, what might that advice look like? I mean, in your unit, the National Assembly Futures Institute, does it go so far as to actually suggest policies? Well, and I'm not really sure if we have a specific uh, economic uh, policy related suggestions for small business or even for big business. Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a real expert in economic policy. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I would like to toss the ball to Youngjun. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, in the past, the, as I said before, the Korea has, Korean government has great strengths in managing and organizing resources in short term because we are very accustomed to uh, catch up growth model. So because of that, the older financial system is uh, oriented toward the short term. But I think the, for the small and medium enterprises and startups, the capital system should be patient capital with the long term and they should wait for their uh, trial and errors. But uh, our the Korean the financial system is very short term and all the incentive systems of the financial system is oriented toward the, uh, how to uh, get a short term benefits from the investment in small and medium enterprises and startups. So I think the financial system's uh, ultimate goal and incentive system or resource allocation mechanism should be uh, transformed from the oriented toward short term toward the patient and long term objectives or such like that. Yeah, I think. Let's broaden the conversation a little bit to think about how the kind of research you're doing might have a global impact. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, first of all, other countries that, again, might be looking at South Korea and trying to learn something from South Korea and the way that the country has dealt with, with COVID, not only here in terms of public health, but also in terms of the kind of economic modeling and future modeling that you're doing. Um, what's your response when another country uh, comes to you or researchers from other countries come to you and say, hey, can we take this model that you're doing and export it? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, if there is something that a Korean case can uh, be insightful to many other countries, I think it's not it's not just solely about its successful uh, uh, successful policy to, you know, uh, uh, to lower the COVID cases. Actually, it, it should be about the insight what the disaster really is. So uh, in case of the US, this is disastrous. And that's period. It's it's just so obvious that people are dying, and uh, uh, and uh, in the U.S., uh, we if we think about the disaster, it just naturally means something that is really big, really powerful, really impactful that everybody experiences. But actually, in South Korean case, uh, now we are in a better position to reimagine the meaning of disaster because I think uh, the type of disaster that we are all passing through uh, during last year and this year is not necessarily about people's, uh, 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 people's uh, death all the time. It's about unseen, micro, mundane, slow and structural disasters happening here and there. I think South Korea is better equipped and better positioned to talk about that sort of more subtle aspect of a disaster and making this, making this disastrous event as a chance to uh, reflect upon the social structure that, you ha that we have built. So I think uh, that would be sort of the, uh, uh, the insight that Korea can provide uh, to other countries, I think. Uh, and, um, mm -hmm. and that's uh, the part of the research that uh, the National Assembly Futures Institute is trying to do. Uh, for, for example, we uh, have just published a short booklet titled Beyond Disaster, Beyond Innovation, 
that tries to redefine the meaning of disaster and the meaning of innovation at the same time. It argued that the disaster is not always about the dramatic event, and innovation is not always about something surprisingly new. The, the, the disaster is mundane, and innovation should be mundane at the same time. And it should be uh, uh, about enhancing people's quality of life and uh, about uh, you know, decreasing the inequality gap. So that has been our insight, I think. Beyond disaster, beyond innovation. People can find that at the website of the National Assembly Future Institute. Yes, uh, unfortunately, the, that booklet was only written in Korean, uh, uh, and uh, actually, I myself was an author. Uh, so, right. if you are interested in that, uh, you can come and uh, uh, skim through that, and I always appreciate your feedback. Okay, that's great. Um, and, and just to want to follow up on that because, um, of course, as a disaster researcher myself, when you talk about the need for awareness of everyday disaster or mundane disaster. And also sort of pushing the innovation concept so that it's not a big bang, but actually thinking about innovation in an incremental way. Um, I get very excited about that because that's how I think about the way most disaster is, is lived. It's often hard to get policymakers excited uh, about things that are not grabbing headlines. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder about that also, just coming back to your methodology, to the way that your institute runs, um, how hard is it to sketch out scenarios or offer findings um, that are that are less dramatic, maybe, than mm -hmm. some policymakers want? And I, I ask that because there's a lot of social science research that says that elected officials generally don't like to think about disasters or do much about them because they'll be out of office by the time um, you know any real recovery. Will happen. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of a built-in problem around government. Exactly. Here. Exactly. I, I wonder what you think about that. Yeah. Well, in my opinion, that is because uh, people define the disaster in that way. If disaster is a random event that accidentally happens, then that will happen in long time future when the politicians is out of office. But if we if we redefine the concept of disaster that is happening all the time, even right now, then it's not the job of the other people. It's the job. It should be a job of the politician in the office right now. So redefining the meaning of disaster also uh, legitimates the needs that this should be the task of politicians right now uh, uh, who are sitting in their table. So. Um, but in terms of the uh, 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 in, in, but in terms of the difficulty of persuading this perspective to politicians, always number makes the scenario much easier. So we need some kind of dramatic splash to persuade politicians. I think uh, one dramatic number is about people who are dying in their working place. So this is an example of mundane a mundane disaster. So I just mentioned that in Korea, cumulative death by the COVID-19 since last year has been uh, 2,222. But last year, last year, solely 2,000 workers passed away in factory by uh, during their work. So they were uh, literally, uh, they literally, literally passed away uh, by accidents happening in a factory. And who can say that that is not a disaster, right? So the factor system we have, economic growth model model we have, that all uh, things are uh, uh, are crystallized as a mundane disease disaster in many workplaces. Mm -hmm. And this number, two thousand alone last year, this uh, is dramatic, and I think this deserves much more attention. And uh, we should really broaden the meaning of disaster by the uh, by uh, this pandemic. I think. That's fascinating insight and, and one that also shows us that if we want to be thinking about futures, we have to also have a clear grasp on what the what ha what's actually happening. Like what are the risks that, that surround us, as you point exactly. out. And yeah. so workplace accidents are often not treated as disaster. They've been totally normalized as just something that's the price of innovation. But if you reframe it as a public health disaster, then you've maybe you've reframed it for policymakers as well. Exactly, exactly. And that is what is many uh, strategic future researches are missing. Because uh, uh, for strategic future foresight research, they do strategic analysis about what kind of future event will happen uh, and based on the probability. 
And I think that that paradigm is actually misleading how should you understand disaster? Because that paradigm itself is defining disaster as something happening in the future with very low probability. But disaster is happening in 100% because it is already happening. So uh, I, I, uh, I would say that the new goal of the future research should be about studying current and the past to think about future, not simply about forecasting future. Because that is making social science uh, different from uh, fortune telling, I think. Right. And, and, you know, I mean, if we consider that um, climate change is, is real and having demonstrable effects year by year, and now with COVID, and I know that the, the unit that you're both in has been doing this research on COVID, um, do we just have to take it for granted now that the kind of futures we need to imagine for policy formation will have disaster as a constant? That, that that just has to be part of the planning. It can't just treat it as something that might happen this year or next year, that that has to be part of the structure of the way that we make policy now. I, either one of you want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. I think Young Jun's work on resilience is talking about that, I think. Tell us about that, mm. Young Jun. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, in terms of the uh, resilience, uh, I think the when also the when we reframing the disaster concept as that uh, uh, as that uh, description, I think that we can see the growth trajectories from the past and preparing the futures considering the path dependencies of the socioeconomic system. And also with this reframed uh, concept, I think the government and also government and or uh, public se sector should uh, establish the resilient capacity to respond to the uh, crisis in terms of the that reframed concept i think the government should uh, establish firstly anticipation capabilities which is related to the foresight and also exploring the past and present and future events and their interlinkages. And I think secondly, government should prepare cushioning capabilities, which is related to the prepare policy options to adapt to crisis or such as the climate change. And lastly, I think adaptation and shaping capabilities, which is related to the implementation of the policy option, should be uh, well equipped to respond to the, the long, uh, slow disaster or slow crisis, mm. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would like to piggyback a little more uh, to Young Jun's comments. Mm. I, I totally agree with that. And that is all uh, 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 making us to think about what do you mean by going back to the normal? It's, I, I think it's, it, it shouldn't be about just going back to the normal because it, it, it never has been normal at all. So mm -hmm. we always have been living in an abnormal time. And now there should be a chance about like not going back to the time we lived before, but it should be a chance for uh, the fundamental social innovation to make our social system more resilient and equal and just. Uh you're not going to get any disagreement from me I mean, and, and on that. And that's a tall order for a restructuring of society coming out of COVID. I think for many of us who are watching it closely, where, um, and you've, you've discussed it both in interesting domains, in the social domain and inequality, but also an economy that is not as nimble as it should be, doesn't support, talks about innovation, but doesn't support innovation. Um, I, I want to push a little bit further in terms of ways that this kind of work can be more open. I mean, I'm struck by the fact that this is a, a unit that answers to the National Assembly. So in that sense, it strikes me as a real an attempt to democratize mm -hmm. scientific research, which I really appreciate. What's the future of your unit in terms of engaging the public even even more? Is that something that you that you think about? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, uh, engagement with the general public to collect their uh, voices about their preferred future 
think this will be uh, one of signature research programs of our institution for a while, I think. And I think this kind of giving a voice to general public to talk about their imagined future should be a one role uh, of this institution as a channel between the politicians and the general public beyond the election process itself. So uh, this democratic agenda for the policy uh, will still be our goal. Uh, and I think you also mentioned about the democratic scientific practices. And uh, uh, I think uh, that kind of a consensus conference and citizen science uh, or living lab, the kind of uh, programs are uh, conducted by many other research organizations in South Korea. I hope to uh, join that kind of trend in future. Uh, well, well, this is maybe too much information. I'm uh, I'm leaving this organization very soon because I'm cha uh, I'm moving to another uh, institution. But maybe, um, yeah, this institution will you know will do that. Youngjun, let me give you a, a chance to respond to any of that, or if anything else you want to tell us about research projects that you have coming up. Uh, yeah. Uh, fr from now on, we are now preparing a research project to collect uh, to promote collective learning for design of our design of our futures i think the future uh, should not be designed by the expertise and also the, not only by the policy makers so from that point with this respect we are now preparing uh, many research projects to uh, invite many citizens and many uh, various stakeholders to design our desirable future images and recommend changes needed in the present to the government and also uh, uh, policy makers. So we are now preparing to establish the open platforms to discuss about our how to design and how to proceed to the desirable futures. So, yeah. How many people do you have working there? How many researchers? Uh, do we have 16 or 17 uh, PhDs? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 16 17. 17. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's relatively a really small organization, and uh, that is both a, a strength and weakness of our organization. And I believe that this should be a strength of our organization because it's a small size, more interdisciplinary, more collaborative, more flexible, and more agile as well. So uh, we have a lot of opportunities uh, on the table, I think. Well, I want to thank you both for your for your time today, and I think it's a it's. We've talked a lot on COVID calls about ways that um, COVID has shaped research, but most of the context I've, I've had that discussion has been the context of the, the academy and, in the, and maybe in public higher education or private higher education, but not in government-based labs, government-based research centers. And that's why I was really looking forward to talking with you today. Um, I mean, COVID's on your agenda now, and it sounds like COVID and future pandemics is going to be on the agenda for the National Assembly Futures Institute going forward, and as well it should be. Um, anything else you, you want to add before we before we close? June, you mentioned a, a new posting coming up for you. Congratulations on that. Anything else you wanted to add? Well, uh, well, I, I would really like to uh, thank you, uh, Scott, because I think this project is really the archive of our time. Uh, I've talked about this to you probably many times, but I think it, it's not enough. I mean, it's uh, this is really a valuable project because right now, the thing that we are recording right now is a, a archive of our time. It should be a historical document uh, after many years. So uh, I really appreciate your efforts to run this uh, COVID call. And we are really glad and we are also very much honored to be a part of this historical data. Well, I greatly appreciate that. Yongjun, did you want to add any, anything as we close out? Uh, yeah, uh, thank, uh, thank you again for inviting us in COVID call. And I think uh, it is very good uh, opportunity for us to think about how to make slow and meaningful changes uh, responsive to the slow disaster. So I think uh, I will follow up the following the episode in COVID calls and I will also make some 
another opportunity to participate in this call again. That's, that's Thank you. great. Thanks so much. Well, this call becomes yeah. part of the archive. Uh, this is number 325, and I'll uh, be looking for an opportunity to have you back in the future as well. Just want to remind everyone you've been listening to COVID calls, a special COVID calls today at 5.30 p.m. Korea time. Please join me in my next COVID calls episode, which will be at 6 p.m. Eastern time, uh, which is for those keeping a calendar handy. It will also be August 23rd, but it'll be 6 p.m. Eastern time. My guest will be Todd Myers, anthropologist of medicine. We'll be talking with him. Please join me for that discussion. And uh, thanks again to my guests, Yong Jun Yo and Jun Jian of the National Assembly Futures Institute. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you next time on COVID Calls.